welcome. Welcome to Creative Arts Apothecary. I'm your host, Marina Sellner, and I'm so excited to introduce my guest, Kathy Melchiotti. Kathy, <laughs> Dr. Melchiotti is a psychologist and an expressive arts therapist specializing in the treatment of traumatic stress. For the last three decades, Kathy has worked with traumatized children, adolescents, adults, and families, expanding the range of understanding of nonverbal sensory-based concepts and methods. She is the executive director of the Trauma-Informed Practices and Expressive Arts Therapy Institute that has provided online and live training in expressive and somatosensory approaches to over 25,000 practitioners around the world. She is a contributing writer for Psychology Today on topics relevant to trauma recovery and restoration of the self, arts and healthcare, and mental health and mental health and self-care. She is also author of Art Therapy Source Book and other definitive trauma and expressive art therapy books. Um, check out her website, her courses, her books. Kathy is an amazing resource and leader in the field. She is also an artist herself. Kathy, welcome. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for joining. I'm a huge- There's a million yeah. to talk about. <laughs> So much to talk about, and I, I'd love to hear a little bit about your background. As an artist yourself, you have this experience and this intuitive knowing that there's this extra level of healing that you can bring to the artwork. At what point, when did you discover expressive arts therapy? Oh, probably when I was seven or eight years old. <laughs> I think a lot of people discover it then. You know, a lot of children discover it. They don't know what it is. Nobody had a name for it then either, right? But let's even go back farther. I mean, before my experience, there was thousands of years of humans doing this kind of work. I think that that is the really important piece that's discounted by modern psychotherapy or whatever we want to call it. All the wonderful talk therapies that are out there that they, I don't know if there's this kind of um, still, I don't want to say ignorance, but lack of understanding that humans, before they talked about their problems, they sang about them, they moved, they did enactments, they created images. And I think a lot of that gets categorized. Well, I was art, right? Yeah, but it was for a purpose. It was to address trauma and loss and things that were disruptive to the community. So I always say this, and I, I just wrote this in a, a handbook of expressive arts therapy. I said, I'm being very bold here to say expressive arts therapy, expressive arts is the original psychotherapy. It's the original way of healing. Mm -hmm. So I think that this is the, the thing, even though we come to it in our lives at different times, maybe as young people or in, you know, in art school, discovering like this is more than just making art to sell. Something's happening. It's, it's ancient. <laughs> you know, we can't deny that. We need to acknowledge that. Beautiful. It's so powerful. And even before we can put any words onto it, or now we have all the, the neurobiology to support it, you're saying, and, and, and we know it, like yeah. kids know it intuitively. And right. it's, it's ancient, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Thank yeah. You. So I think that's the missing thing now. And because I, I look at it uh, a lot in the field of mental health, because it's a lot of the people I interact with are really great trauma specialists. And mm -hmm. they support this idea, but they don't really even know like how far it goes back, you know, and, and how core it is. And really it was the starting place for healing. So I, I think it's fascinating. There's brilliant minds out there and they're just kind of finding out <laughs> like, wow, these kinds of art forms are really necessary for a lot of people to recover. So what, why, or what's the, what's the connection? Tell us more, what's the connection between recovering from trauma and expressing yourself what, Not because what? It's, it's implicit and it's action oriented and mostly because it's sensory based you know we don't necessarily when we're just talking to each other we have some kind of sense of each other maybe you know some sensations come up but when we ask people to create an image or to move make a gesture start to use sound, you know, uh, and, and act, play, you know, even be playful. You're, do, you're getting these multiple senses that you don't get through just talk therapy. I mean, talk therapy is language-based. 
So, you know, it, it taps senses, but not anywhere near as the many as the expressive work will tap in terms of sensory experiences and senses in the body, not just what's going on up here, <laughs> right? You know, so, yeah, and I, I think a lot of trauma people and healthcare people, people that facilitate even body work, uh, a lot of different kinds of people, educators in the classrooms, they're really starting to understand that they need to put this in place so that people can have another experience or another way to communicate what's going on with them. Mm, yeah. So good. Yeah. So in, in these interviews, we talk a lot about creative blocks. Mm -hmm. and uh, like writer's block or being afraid of like the blank canvas. And so you put an interesting perspective on it because you talk about imagination block. Mm -hmm. so even mm -hmm. with, before the technique itself, there's something very essential that's going on. Can you say more about that? Well, I, what I find amongst people that are involved in this, and that can be people that are university professors or educators, or they talk about with a lot of knowledge about expressive arts. But when you work with trauma and try to tap imagination, you have a different situation going on. People sometimes have deactivated that imagination for a good reason. They're surviving by not thinking and imagining things that are really disturbing. So some of that and sometimes in some cases, all of it gets shut down. People just become numb. And I think sometimes in the literature, people talk about, oh, the imagination is the cure. Maybe, but you have to help people get there and you have to open it up slowly and sensitively through the different kinds of experiences that you can offer. People that are traumatized are pretty smart about how to survive. And that's one of the things they shut away along with playfulness along with you know uh, different forms of expression because it's all fearful to go in those places that involve curiosity and imagination so i think it's a central piece but i think we need to be careful too about how we open it up to people that makes sense <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah, but i think it's true after decades of working with people with trauma and children starting with children I immediately saw that, you know, when you see the average three or four year old that's had a good, probably solid nurturing upbringing, and you see them in a, a preschool, for example, and they're playing with everything. They're into the sand, they're into the water, they're using things very imaginatively and creatively, but the child who's had adverse experiences is just stunned. And I saw that in working with children with domestic violence in their background, interpersonal violence and, and assault and abuse to them. They would sit and you'd, you'd think like, wow, why aren't they interacting with all these toys and art and, you know, and all these things that they could touch and play with. They, they've shut all that imagination down. It's been so scary for them to just survive. And then I realized like, wow, the difference between these children in the same age range and these other children who would just play freely, the imaginative thing is shut away. How do we bring that back, you know, in, you know into their consciousness, into their lives, into their experiences? So how? I think, yeah, yeah, well, how is through all the senses, but gradual you know, not just throwing people into like overstimulating situations, you know, maybe just explaining. One thing I think that has to be explained to people is um, the difference between, we use the word creative a lot interchangeably with imagination and expressiveness. That's why I like the term expressive arts therapy. I like the expressive word because a lot of times people come in and I say, I, I've heard that this will help me and I believe that it might, I don't know what it is yet. And I know you're going to introduce me to it, but I don't feel like I'm creative, you know? And I just say, a lot of days I wake up and I had an art background. You don't always feel creative. You feel like the muse is in there. You know, you don't come up with ideas you feel are, are really creative or imaginative, but everybody can be expressive. They can always be expressive. I said, if you just make a line on paper, you know, just to show the rhythm of how you feel today, that's expressive. And everybody can do that. And then they start to feel, okay, and I, I can be expressive. And I say, then, you know, we might get to a point when you come one day and you do something and you think like, wow, 
this I felt was really creative. I did something really unique. So I think that creative word is very personal. It's probably even multicultural. We don't, you know, different people have a different idea about it. And then people start to engage the imagination. They realize, wow, I thought of something new. I, I could see something, you know, differently. Uh, yeah. So th it seems like the expressive, I love that because expressive work is what leads to those other things. So I always think like when people use, oh, you know, you're going to have a creative experience. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> I mean, again, as artists, do we always feel creative each and every day? No, sometimes we really struggle. And when we have the language and comfort with the, the media or the process. So I think that's another thing we have to think about. But again, everybody can be expressive. Once people know that, then they start to loosen up. They think like, okay, it's okay to make a mark this way. It's okay to make a gesture this way. It's okay to stand up and move with Kathy or whoever they're working with, uh, you know, and start to develop a language around expression. And that's what leads to the other things very slowly and sensitively to the creative kind of self and also the imagination opening up. Beautiful. That really takes the pressure off of performance. Yeah. And you just... I think that's the first thing we have to do. I mean, people, you know, again, I'm just speaking about people who have experienced trauma or loss they've been under a lot of stress, right? We don't wanna create more stress with the process itself. We wanna introduce it in a way that feels comfortable, feels calming, starts to feel more natural. And just, you know, in relationship with them, they start to feel comfortable with us maybe co-creating together something. And as we build that, the other things, the fear starts to fall away because that's a mm -hmm. lot of what goes on. People are, you know, not necessarily fearful of you as the facilitator or therapist or coach or whatever. It's that they generally have a fear, you know, fear of anything because they had to protect. And that's a healthy thing that will, you know, it's not making their life feel any better. We want to kind of start to help them be expressive, feel more curious and more playful through the work, yeah. And I think those are the restorative factors once people start to sense that. And again, I go back to those three and four-year-olds and seeing the difference between the children who had a you know, very supportive you know, upbringing, very good attachment with a caregiver versus children who had been hurt and abused and subjected to adverse events and not having that joy and, and capacity for playfulness. And that's what a lot of people come in with that, you know, have serious trauma or loss. And you, you mentioned the possibility of, of joy uh, um, from this experience. Um, that, that's really beautiful. How do you, uh, people come to you knowing, yeah, intuitively, I know that this may help me, just not sure how, or how do you build that trust? Well, I think, I, when you're working with people, you kind of have to plant the seed too, that there's hope that things are gonna change, right? And so that's part of just how you act and believe in them and, and interact with them. But also I always say, you know, one of the things you, we wanna do first is you have, you know, feelings that are either terrorizing and making you anxious or feelings that make you shut down and numb out the world. Sometimes people have both, you know, and that's a horrible way to go through life. We want to find ways that we're going to reduce that, right? So that's one of the main goals because people don't come. I always say people don't come to therapy, for example, as a tourist. <laughs> they come because they feel bad, you know? I mean, that's what drives them there. It's a hard thing to come to therapy and say, you know, admit that my life is really going badly. I feel bad every day. I don't have pleasure in life. But I think that's the other key there is to say also, where we want to go is, okay, we'll read, you know, hopefully I'm going to help you reduce those feelings or be able to get those adjusted somehow, and you'll be able to feel better more than feel badly. But we also want to replace it with something. And that's the wonderful thing about expressive work. We can talk people into that, but it's not so easy. If they're doing something that brings joy, brings curiosity, brings playfulness, gives them a sense of compassion, maybe even mastery and confidence and playfulness. We're replacing that part also that was hurt, that felt damaged, that felt, you know, felt bad 
with good rhythms, with good experiences, with, you know, senses that, wow, I really enjoy this experience of making this or moving this way or, you know, playing the drum in a certain way. Um, that's what's really different about expressive approaches versus talk therapy. We can give them actual experiences that bring those, I call it a capacity for all these things. Um, you know, to be able to feel calm, to be able to feel pleasure, to be able to feel playfulness, to reduce that fear and turn it into curiosity. And, you know, that hands-on action-oriented, again, you know, sensory-based work. I often wonder, like, how do talk therapists talk people into feeling better? <laughs> I think some of, you know, a lot of people really need this kind of real body-based I'm involved, I'm creating kind of experience in order to feel restored, right? I don't know. I mean, I hope that makes sense. That totally makes sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And what's, what's something that surprised you the most um, working in this way? Um, that most people eventually do feel that they can um, have a capacity for pleasure, because sometimes the stories I think are so harsh, uh, so adverse. Uh, and I'll just give you an example, not to divulge, I won't divulge a case, but there are a lot of uh, female military that I've worked with or talked to, and they have experienced in their military service multiple assaults, you know, sexual assaults. This is all too common in the military. And you look at somebody like that and you think like, wow, I mean, an amazing survivor, amazing that you're here today seeking, you know, some kind of help or assistance or support, but how do you ever, you know, overcome that? And they do, they do, you know, it's through, but it's through a process again of engaging the body in something, engaging in the expression. The talk may help them. I'm sure it does because there's a lot of effective, again, talk therapy but the doing and the engaging the body in expressive and what they eventually perceive as something creative or something that stimulates the imagination, something for them that empowers them is the real turning point with that. So, you know, that I say surprised, but obviously I really believe in these methods. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not so surprised, but, you know, it is when you think about it, how humans can overcome and change uh, and transform and then restore themselves is pretty surprising and amazing. Yes, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Restore and transform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And the fact that something, again, even though now we know more about like you know, what, how is a good way to present these expressive methods? There's still, again, an ancient form of, of recovery and restoration. Yeah. yeah. Um, can, can you tell us something that you're working on these days that's really lighting you up? Um, actually, I would say um, two, a couple things. One thing uh, that I've I've had on the plate for 25 years. This is silly to say. I had a book in 1998 that was the, the book that really um, hit the marketplace as a bestseller. It was Understanding Children's Drawings. So the editor that I worked with, I became friends with, and she has eventually beaten me into <laughs> submission to, to I, I would say that jokingly, to revise it and it, well, it really needs a revision because so much we know now and it's mm -hmm. we look so differently at people in therapy we didn't talk back then about trauma informed work which is really centralizing the person in the therapeutic relationship and, and cultural issues and so many things gender issues 1998, we weren't even close to talking and thinking about people in the multidimensional ways we think about now and really putting them um, as co-creators in therapy. Now with children, even less because children, you know, have historically not had rights. The adults are the ones that make the decisions for them. So that book 
rewriting it now is is a major revision because it's it's so much that we know and also we know more about how children experience trauma experience loss experience different things in their lives the social justice issues a lot of different things that come into um, how we view children now so that that it's an exciting but hard project but it's well worth the time um, because now we have children, right, that are very anxious or depressed or both because of the last few years. And even before that, I say two other things. I mean, the political climate, they can pick up on the divisiveness, you know, that's around them. And even, you know, even though they're not voters, <laughs> they, they understand that there's something not quite right. Uh, and also social media. Social media has had an impact on them. So then the pandemic comes along and they're in the classroom, out of the classroom, and you know, back and forth, not getting the normal developmental kinds of experiences. A lot of them became very isolated. Some of them now are still struggling with that. And so we're looking at, you know, young children all the way up through young adults. They've been really impacted. So thinking about all of that uh, and now thinking wow, their bodies really got immobilized, you know, told to stay home, uh, you know, different struggles with that, then being reintroduced to the classroom, but a lot, a lot of times with masks, right, and all that. I think that this work is fascinating right now because we are going to have to teach a whole generation how to resensitize their bodies, to co-regulate with somebody, you know, be in attunement with others, but as in the arts, I mean, the arts-based approaches are just totally, I think the only way to go about it. It can't be done through a screen. It can't be done through just talk. They need to really experience their bodies again in a positive way. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, all that's going into that project and thinking about that. But can I show you this? This just came. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. This was a, uh, we call it a pandemic book <laughs> because it took, a, it took a longer time than I ever thought it would take because um, all of us were impacted in our ability to think for the last couple of years. So all these wonderful authors, because there's, there's multiple authors in there that are in the field of expressive arts therapy contributed, but it was, it was really an uphill kind of struggle for all of us. We were all challenged with separation and all that but every everything came together finally and it just it just emerged <laughs> this week you know this that I never I really didn't believe it was ever going to get there I mean I knew it was going to because I had a contract I needed to finish and, and I wanted to do the book but um, I think it's really timely now I just thought like well if this came out earlier I don't think it would have been the right time I think now is the time to really uh, put this field together in a way that a large audience can understand. So all the chapters are written that way. I'm so proud of the uh, authors in the book because they cover so many things that are going to be helpful to so many different people. So it's not just for the expressive arts therapist community. It's really for the mental health and healthcare world. But I think like, wow, you know, it's kind of funny. Like uh, we still have the pandemic around, but, you know, hopefully it's winding down. But, um, you know, it wasn't born during the pandemic. It was just uh, this uh, process of getting through the pandemic and everybody writing their chapters and coming together to create this volume. So, so yeah, that's been the other thing. So that this has led to other ideas that I don't know where they're going yet. <laughs> you know, so like exciting. Process, right, you know? What's when, that? Like any creative process, one thing leads to another. Indeed. Yeah. So yeah. I think there's a lot now to, you know, I guess why I brought that up was it's not even a sales pitch. It's about the fact that the fact that that, that the book now exists, I, I hope it opens the door to a lot of people being able to write and articulate the, the ideas that are in there and really expand them, really start to, I feel like they're, they're just like the right time for that, for so many people now to join for forces and and get out there and start to explain all the variety of this. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, so that's exciting. And I think like, wow, took the pandemic to kind of <laughs> create some different scenarios that we never 
thought we'd experience. We had no idea what was coming. Yeah. So, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and, yeah. and how how wonderful that that this field is here to like step up to step up to the occasion because now it's not just a few a few unlucky people or something like that. This is the human experience. The whole world needs healing. Yeah. I think a lot of people in this field feel that way, even if they haven't consciously thought about it, but they, I think a lot of them will be addressing this for quite a while. Again, with the younger people, especially, but I think, you know, you even look at older people, right? Who got isolated because they were rightly fearful of catching, you know, COVID catching the virus and being, you know, in the category of where we had the most people that died. So I'm hoping too that it kind of infiltrates along the lifespan mm -hmm. and helps people kind of understand and express their experiences. But also again, back to that capacity. How do I resensitize my body now after I've been through several years of this really scary, scary time? And how do I, you know, start to re, you know replace that scariness that fearfulness with opening up my curiosity again feeling mobilized again able to move able to enact able to express and have that joy again and playfulness so i think you know when i talk about younger people it goes all the way through you know all the age groups so yeah so we need to we need to get out there and start this work now that we can be a little safer <laughs> and interact because it really is relational too. We've done this kind of thing over the screen with telehealth, but now going back and teaching workshops and being able to be with people. Wow, you really appreciate it now too. You really appreciate being in the same room and watching people start to explore and be curious and create you know, and manifest and be imaginative in real time. You know, this has been great that we had it. They didn't have this in a, the past pandemic 100 years ago. <laughs> but this is, yeah, this is not the same as human to human, getting together, moving together, being in synchrony, being in rhythm, you know, building on each other's energies. Yeah, so it's quite amazing to now have that perspective. Like, okay, we can do this, but we need to be together. We're humans. <laughs> we need to be in the same space to create and manifest imagination mm. yeah well thank you for for providing us with all these tools and resources and i'm, I'm going to use the word creative it really feels like you're yeah. you're you're up to so much creativity no not at all yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a special word you know you know when you have that you because you can i you see that in even the average person who never had an art background you see that a lot in the military population mm. they come to a point when wow well, I feel like what I just did, whether it was in visual art or was in movement, a lot of them engage in theater, they know it. They, they all of a sudden, whoa, they own it. They own it. They, they've, they know when they've reached that personal place of creativity for them. So yeah, that's the wonder of all of this. Yeah, yeah. Wonder, wonder is right and power is so empowering. And just uh -huh. think, Exactly, yeah, wow. I think that's really key. I think when you have that, sense of empowerment yeah then then it makes a whole difference in your outlook every day you have hope you know that you can move forward yeah can can you give us a glimpse before we go i mean you kind of have been giving us a huge glimpse into your own personal practice but what what's that like your your personal Oh, regulation creativity what's that like it changes uh week to week so sometimes mm these drums back here and more I have you can't even see all the drums <laughs> I just bought another drum in uh, in uh, Taos New Mexico <laughs> which is on its way here so yeah I mean and then I'll take up new instruments see I, I start out in visual art so that to me is home right you have a core I think a lot of people have a certain core that they operate from some people it's dance movement and some people it's writing and other people you know it's visual arts so, uh, but I, I tend to like to use music for kind of my aspiration. I would say I'm an aspiring musician, 
but the visual art is where I can just come home to very easily. So, so, you know, just all different kinds of media because I never focused on one type of media in art school. Like some people, you know, they just focus on painting and they're very good at painting, but I like all kinds of uh, media to work in. So why not? <laughs> it's all a different sensory experience too, you know, yeah. So yeah, that's a regular part of my life, but, but this other is too. <laughs> <laughs> because I think um, actually rhythm and movement are the core things that really help people heal. If you're, and again, I'm just speaking about trauma. People get a lot of joy from doing art, making art, and making images, all of that. But it's very um, self-focused, uh, self-regulating. It can be, you know, calming to the body. But what they need mostly is to move first and then put that into the art. Yeah, because you get frozen in the trauma and that's the worst mm -hmm. thing. It will only get worse. That's where post-traumatic stress comes from mostly is feeling like one can't move. So think about that over the last couple of years, we all got there a little bit with the pandemic. So we were told, don't move, don't go out of your house. Or if you do, stay away, six feet, 12 feet, all these different restrictions on our movement. So just think about that would traumatize people who knew maybe to not get hurt or assaulted. They need to be quiet. They need to be under the radar. So moving is in rhythm are the basic things that really need to happen. So where's that going to happen in talk therapy? Again, I'm not <laughs> criticizing talk therapy, but I always tell people, if you're doing talk therapy, learn some of these things where you can move with people because they're getting frozen. Hmm. talk will help some help the thoughts but it won't help the body feel like it's alive again and can move and have confidence and empowerment like you said empowerment yeah all of it so good the aliveness all i hear because just these are all my favorite subjects i wish we we didn't need it so but but we do and yeah. and, and thank you for for championing it and uh for all the work that you do you teach a lot and write a lot i'm just thank you so much really You're welcome <laughs> and to our audience remember to stay creative <laughs> maybe get some dance moves in there i'm i'm ready for a dance party kathy thank you and everybody have a great day